Paul Waitman is the founder and former CEO of Cromwell, one of the largest property groups in Australia. Having stepped down from Cromwell in late 2020, we find out why he left and what led to the genesis of his new venture, Stara Real Estate Capital and Advisory. Paul is a passionate Queenslander and has extreme optimism in the decade leading up to the Brisbane 2032 Olympics. A view we share in common. We find out where Paul is investing his money and why starting with a clean slate allows for clarity on how an investment platform should operate in the modern era. If you'd prefer, the full 30 minute interview is available in audio format on our podcast. And I've left a link to the podcast on Spotify in the description below. Before we get started, please leave a like on the video if you enjoy it and be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss our next great interview or story. Now let's hear what Paul has to say because today we're talking tactics. Paul Waitman, welcome to Talking Tactics. Thanks, Bill. Paul, uh, you founded Cromwell back in 1998 and you built it into an international property powerhouse with about 12 billion in funds under management, market cap over 3 billion. Why did you leave? <laughs> Well, there was a, a very well publicised um, campaign for control of Cromwell. There were a couple of investors who liked what they saw but wanted to have a different strategy. So over a couple of years, um, this campaign went on until uh, these two investors got to the point where they could control the composition of the board, which they changed. And I guess at that point, um, my vision for the business wasn't the same as their vision for the business. So um, look, they wanted to have a different strategy, um, had different priorities, and clearly it was, uh, it was time for me to go and do other things. Well, it gave you a chance to renew, reset, have a think about what you wanted to do in the future, and that's led you to commencing a, a new venture, uh, Stara Real Estate Capital and Advisory. That's right. Can right. you tell us a little bit about your new venture? Sure. When I left Cromwell at the end of 2020, uh, I had six weeks off. I think um, my wife at that stage decided that was enough time for me to spend at home. Um, so we went, uh, basically set up Stara with Jody Clark, who was my old COO, Patrick, my son, who was the transactions manager at Cromwell. It was a good time to actually be out of the market and, uh, you know, we were interested spectators with what was going on. I think there was a bit of a, a two-speed real estate market at the time. You know, there was capital still looking um, to invest on the back of that whole weight of capital issue. But there were others who were probably more guarded about where the market was going and we fell into that camp. We saw an opportunity uh, to advise businesses on funds, fund establishment, um, access to capital but also um, to set up another funds management platform that would enable us to come into the market without any legacy issues, but also learn the lessons that uh, you know, have been taught over the last four or five years. Well, it does seem like a good time to start anew because we were going down that uh, quite an aggressive tightening cycle in cap rate compression. Obviously, interest rates have now gone up, so probably is a good time to, to be out there uh, looking at assets as uh, They've probably uh, corrected in pricing. Yeah, well, certainly we don't have um, the legacy issues that a number of managers have. You know, I think that period from 2019 particularly onwards um, was really, a, I don't know whether you call it a race to the bottom or a race to the top, but um, certainly it was all about deployment of capital. Um, I'm not sure there was uh, much regard for quality of investment, but you know, the name of the game for a lot of managers was to get money out the door as quickly as you can and um, invest them into assets. And you know, I think as we've seen the lessons over the last few years that have been taught um, probably reinforces the fact that those decisions weren't the best. Well, and one of the industries that you're focusing on as part of Stara is in the hospitality Absolutely. industry. And that's, uh, that's a market that has been severely impacted over the last several years. Uh, why is investing in hospitality now a good time? Well, I think um, for, for a number of reasons. It's a highly fragmented market. I think you know, the two biggest operators in the industry um, are passive 
rent collecting landlords. I think you've got a lot of private operators who operate freehold go and concern pubs who are under pressure from high regulation. Uh, you know, they've got into generational wealth issues. Um, they find it difficult as a standalone to achieve scale, access to labour, invest in technology and or access the capital that they need to actually reposition their businesses. They do have to wear a lot of different hats, don't they? Look, it's a, it's a massive challenge and I think you know, all of those things are operating to make it um, very, very difficult for those um, owner-occupiers who represent 65% of the market to actually invest with confidence in the future. So, you know, to do this well, you've got to have a very efficient operating platform. You've got to access the latest technology. You've got to have a very advanced labour management platform. And you've got to be able to have access to capital to actually make the investments that make a difference. I think a lot of the, the platforms that struggled in 2020, 2021, you know, were standalone operators. You know, they didn't have the depth of capital to be able to last. Those that did, I think, you know, have survived and are going to do very well. And they're going to capitalise on this wave of socialisation, these changes to behaviours um, that we're seeing now that, you know, as a, again, as a species, bring us all together, um, let us focus on um, collaboration and socialisation in ways perhaps that we didn't do before. You know, the, the days of the Friday afternoon visit to the pub with your work colleagues, I think are over. You know, it's Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays is the standard work week. We're seeing much more localised socialising than you see in the CBD. And I think all of that operates to accelerate this behavioural change that we're talking about. And when, I guess, you come into the mix now, what is wrong with the traditional sort of landlord-tenant relationship in the hospitality sector? What, what's fundamentally the issue with the existing structure? Well, I think, you know, what we've seen in other asset classes is it, it does become an adversarial structure. You know, landlord wants to maximise rent, tenant wants to minimise rent, you know, they're at loggerheads. And they are typically tied more to the site as a hospitality-based user, whereas an office tenant can effectively just move to any building. So, you know, I think our view is that the sectors that are most likely um, to be able to generate value are the sectors that perhaps, you know, people think might have been most affected over the changes in the last few years, you know. Retail, particularly um, everyday needs retail, and hospitality. But they're the sectors that are most conducive to generating value when you've got a good operating platform. So, you know, where, where you've got the traditional landlord-tenant model and you don't have that overlap of interest, that alignment of interest, to ensure that the bottom line is maximised and the experience is maximised, you don't generate the value. And going back to the point I made earlier, you know, we built Cromwell on the basis that you can't be a passive real estate investor and accumulator and hope to outperform. You've got to add value. And you can't be an aggregator of passive assets because all you get is reversion to the mean. You know, you've got to manage assets in a way that generates the best possible cash flow and the best possible operating performance. You know, I think if you look at office, a challenge is going to be generating that cash flow. As we've seen investment directed on the expectation of cap rate compression, you know, we, we see that, that, that ch the challenges that that presents are compounded by the structure of the office sector. We're looking at assets that can provide upside protection against inflation, to take advantage of the behavioural changes that we're seeing, to take advantage of that socialisation principle, and that can demonstrate value-adding opportunities through asset enhancement initiatives.
And you've designed the first fund that you're about to launch with a lot of these principles in mind, the Venue Hospitality Fund. That's Can right. you tell us a little bit more about the opportunity? Yeah, so I, I think the, the idea of this started um, when Steve Denise and I got together and we decided uh, with his background in hospitality, um, there were some great insights that he had into, into the market. And um, we then partnered up with uh, Adrian and Nick Rosado, who built the Raw Group um, hospitality platform from the ground up from 1994. Very successful business, very good operators. Uh, and we basically took all of these principles on board and with effectively a blank piece of paper said, well, look, what, what is the structure? What is the fund? What are the management principles that we need to have in place here to be able to generate value and returns over time? And align the interests between owner and operator. And, and where we see the potential for investors is to have exposure to both. You know, I've always been a very strong advocate if you're going to invest in an asset class, you've got to have experts in that sector. You know, in the retail sector, you've got to have absolute retail experts in hospitality, absolute hospitality experts. To give investors the upside that comes not only from the real estate, but also the outperformance of a platform, we thought gives the greatest potential for return. It also mitigates any downside risk. You know, if you're a, an institutional manager and you've outsourced um, the operations of an asset to a third party um, with which you have no alignment. You have very little control over the outcome and very little opportunity to manage or mitigate your downside risk. A little you know, transparency a as well. You know exactly what's happening in your business. You have a high degree of visibility on the performance numbers. You are in a position where you can manage outcomes. If you're a remote landlord trying to run a portfolio somewhere else in Australia, apart from the rent checks you get, what degree of visibility, what transparency is there to what's happening on the ground? I really like the idea of having a high degree of visibility to what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in your operations. Can you give us a little bit of an overview on some of the highlights, so I guess, or some of the assets that are involved as um, part, part of this fund? Sure. Um, we've focused I think in the first instance on um, identifying the operating platform that we want um, to be able to scale a business up to a point where we get to that maximum degree of profitability. So we've got um, 10 operating businesses as part of the Raw Group and their household names, you know, some of um, um, the better known uh, operating restaurants, Madame Wu, Chew the Fat, um, and the beach house chain of hotels and restaurants. That operating platform gives scale of technology, it gives scale in terms of labour, um, it gives scale of buying power, and it gives um, very good upside in terms of rebates with that buying power. So overlaying on that are assets that we're buying that we think as freehold going concerns, we can add value to. So we've got an excellent asset um, in Emu Park. Uh, we've got an excellent asset at Beachmere, both of which have either opportunities to add um, retail or opportunities for development. The Emu Park asset in particular has a great uh, development potential existing. Well, it really video. speaks to that value add nature and being a lot more of a, an active manager on the assets that- That's it, that's it. You know, we're not, we're not here to clip the ticket. We're here to add value for people. Um, and if you can't do that as a manager, you shouldn't be in, in the business. And, and a group like Raw Group, who were obviously interested in the, in the pitch that you've delivered them, if there's other hoteliers, pub owners, presumably you're looking for more to acquire off the back of this transaction as yeah, well. Yeah, where we see an opportunity is with that 65% of the market, um, that are in freehold going concern operations who want to maintain an association with the sector 
but don't want the day-to-day -day compliance, don't want the labour management issues, um, you know, want to be able to um, see opportunities that they've got with their, their facilities capitalised on. Where we're focused is in Queensland. We think the opportunities in South East Queensland, basically anything below the Tropic of Capricorn, is tremendous over the next decade. With the Olympics, with population growth, with regionalisation, um, with the amount of transport infrastructure that's going to be developed, it's probably the best place in the world to invest over the next decade. I would wholeheartedly agree with you as well. I think that this is a, there's a tremendous opportunity for this state and um, you've built already a significant multi-billion dollar business in this state. You based your international headquarters here in Brisbane and now you're, you are focused on buying assets within the state. Um, why do you think Queensland is a great place to do business? Having grown up here and you know been a proud Queenslander and been to the first state of origin game you know I'm and it pr pretty much everyone si since then there's no denying that I'm incredibly parochial so whatever I say has got to be seen through that lens um, but in terms of lifestyle you know, quality of life you know we talk about affordability here but it's you know still a you know, relatively affordable market and I think it's going to get a bit more affordable over the next few years. The decentralisation we've got in the state, um, the mineral resources, um, the fact that Brisbane really skipped that whole rust belt manufacturing um, generation that New South Wales and Victoria went through. Um, you know, what it meant was that we got a bit of a jump as a services oriented market into service provision and technology development. You know, we didn't have the legacy issues and legacy assets and industries um, that they had in New South Wales and Victoria. So in that sense, we're, a, you know, we're more of a new economy state than we are from you know, an, evol an evolving manufacturing state. Now that's, that's had a number of implications, um, both in terms of um, pollution, um, utilisation of manufacturing slash industrial resources, um, but I think it's, it's also attracted people who were more so service oriented, more entrepreneurial, um, and who have more of a focus on the new economy and new skills than perhaps other markets would have done in previous decades. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a young demographic, it's a skilled demographic that's suitable for the next generation. Um, and, you know, we're all together in probably the best place in the world to live. So what's not to like? What do you think that the Olympics uh, is going to mean for Brisbane? I think it's going to reinforce um, not only for Brisbane, for Queensland, our identity. You know, I think if you map out the turning points um, for Brisbane and for Queensland, you know, they were the Commonwealth Games, you know, Expo, you know, they brought big changes to Brisbane. The Olympics will do the same, you know, it'll reinforce the identity of who we are and what we are. It will certainly bring a lot of infrastructure spending, I hope. Um, hopefully they get started soon. I think it's also going to have a fairly significant increase in population. So, look, what's the challenge now? It's providing the housing. You know, if we can get over that hurdle and we can provide affordable housing to accommodate the people who want to live here, um, you know, I think we've got tremendous opportunity. Um, there will be a push out into the regions. You know, I think you're going to see more massive growth in that corridor out towards Toowoomba. You're going to see more massive growth north. You're going to see massive growth into uh, a number of the coastal cities and the, um, uh, the, the mining oriented cities. You know, we talk about the La Nina events. It's brought a lot of rain, but it's going to bring an enormous amount of wealth to the bush as well. You know, the, the, the impact on our agricultural sector is going to be phenomenal. So, you know, 
A lot of the planets are aligning. Um, I would like to think that you know, in the coming decade, we're going to see Brisbane thought of less as a branch office town and more as a head office town as some of these technology and service-based industries start to evolve. You know, I think um, it, 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 it's interesting when you see how dynamic our ASX 200 or ASX 300 is over time. You know, decades a long time. And with the activity that we're seeing in Queensland, I think we can see the potential for a lot of startups, a lot of capital to be invested here, and certainly a lot of growth. Yeah, it certainly feels like globally, if you were going to invest anywhere, Australia is a pretty good bet. And if you were going to put your money anywhere in Australia, it's probably Brisbane and Queensland in general, off the back of this um, super highway of 10 years of growth leading up to the Olympics and probably a 10 year afterglow of that. Presumably, you're looking for investors for the venue hospitality fund. Um, you're putting some of your own cash behind oh, it as absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, how, what's the best way for someone to invest? What type of investors are you looking for into the fund? So for the, the hospitality fund, we're looking at wholesale sophisticated investors. So you know, that's people who are investing minimum of 500,000 or um, who have, uh, can demonstrate an income over the last two years of 250,000 or two and a half million of, of uh, investable assets. Um, you know, th this is um, an opportunity that we think is going to be attractive to a lot of people who are happy to invest in those types of structures. It's an open fund with liquidity events and um, quarterly um, liquidity from 2025. So, you know, we, th we think it's something that's going to grow over time and provide good upside. You know, as I said, our, our focus is on cash returns, not just, you know, um, book-based total returns that fluctuate with valuations. We want to see cash in people's hands. And that's where we see the, the real positive from this fund. And if someone owns, you know, five or ten pubs uh, or Come a hotel, talk to yeah, happy to talk to you. Drop no. you a line on your on your website. Absolutely. Um, we'll put a link in the au. And if you'd like to know more about the fund, uh, certainly the details will be up there, and we'd be happy to send an information memorandum to you. Paul Whiteman, thanks for talking tactics. Thanks, Mel. I don't know about you, but I could listen to plenty more of what Paul has to say, and you can. The full version of the interview is on our podcast. There's a link to the podcast on Spotify in the description below. What did you think? Is now the best time to buy a pub? Do you agree with Paul? I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments section down below. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up and then subscribe to the channel. It really helps and I'd appreciate the support so I can keep bringing you high profile Australian personalities and share their knowledge with you. Before I let you go, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my company, Tactic. We are an end-to-end -end solution for your office space needs. We can help source your new space, negotiate the lease, design the fit out and project manage the delivery of the build. We have an award-winning in-house design team and deliver first-class quality builds. And we've simplified the entire process, so you only need to deal with our team rather than needing to coordinate multiple different service providers, saving you time so you can focus on your core business. If you, your business, or someone you know is looking for a new place to work in, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at www.tactic.au. Yep, that's www.tactic.au or drop me a line at mela at tactic.au. Those links are down in the description below and I look forward to hearing from you so we can help you get into a great new office space. That's it from me. Until the next interview, I'm Mel Picos and we've been talking tactics.